Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another conversation on Business We Defined. We want to talk about matters regarding IFRS 17. It has been touted as the first truly international financial reporting standards for insurance contracts and we want to spend the next 25 or so minutes to unpack this and what it means for the insurance industry in this country and what you should be focusing on. We are delighted to have Gauri Shah from PwC where she's a director as well as the team lead on matters regarding IFRS 17. Welcome on set. Thank you. Delighted to have you this morning. So Gauri, let's start from here. Um, the comment that this is truly the first international financial reporting standard for insurance contracts. Do you agree with that? And if you do agree, what does that mean? So it actually is. And, and maybe let me start with IFRS 4, which is currently in place um, globally, although obviously some leading European and, 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 and developed economies have their local gap. Um, IFRS 4 was always an interim standard. Um, there was always supposed to be another standard that came that allowed for greater comparability, one way of measurement, and, and all of that. But that standard has taken a couple of decades, you know, two to three decades, to actually develop, actually finesse, um, and now it's finally here. Um, so 1 January 2023 was the implementation date. It is here with us. Um, and what that standard really is trying to do is to harmonize the way in which insurance companies measure liabilities and report profitability, which at the moment, and we don't have to go far, if you look at Kenya versus some of our neighboring countries, here in Kenya, we have an actuarial approach to measuring liabilities. Yeah. Um, you just need to go one neighboring country uh, 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 away from us, um, and actually, a lot of insurance company liabilities are still measured as a proportion of their claims reserves, of, of their outstanding claims reserves. Very disparate measures. IFRS uh, 4 allowed that. IFRS 17 harmonizes that. So there is one way of reporting, which, which then speaks to what you said, you know, is, is truly one international standard that is going to harmonize um, uh, the way in which insurance companies are valued and reported. So the question then emerges, um, what does this transition from IFRS 4 to IFRS 17 mean as far as... Uh companies' balance sheets are concerned, and by this, just for the sake of our audience, I mean when you look at your assets vis-a-vis -vis your liabilities. Okay, sure. Um, so maybe also let me, let me say this standard wasn't written for East Africa. This standard was written for large listed organizations, um, um, and, and, you know, it's a very, very involving standard, very painful to implement as well. In terms of what it means from a numbers perspective, so, um, you know, if, if we look at the players that are further advanced, especially in developed economies, you can see that, that it, the impact is different for short-term writers versus long-term writers. Um, short-term writers typically being what we call general insurance in this market, long-term writers being our sort of life insurance. Um, general insurance companies don't see a very big change because of the way in which the liabilities are measured. Um, life insurance companies see the bigger change. And the biggest change there really is, is um, when you write a long-term contract, what the standard wants you to do is to earn and recognize your profit over that long term. But very simply, at the moment, when you write a 30-year contract, which could be a life insurance contract, an annuity, the minute you write the contract, you take your expected profit, put it in your P&L, goes into your equity, uh, you know, and, 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 and is part of your financial uh, 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 reports for this year. Under IFRS 17, that profit is earned over the life of the 30 years. So that's a big difference. So there's a big day one impact. Uh, but then over the years, it's, it's, you know, sort of, sort of stabilizes itself. The question which emerges from that, I'd imagine many Kenyans would then ask, will this significantly change the pricing that is normally attached to various products? So, my, so I really hope it does. And I think we know in our market we're notorious around pricing, particularly in the short-term sector, the general insurance sector. One of the other things IFRS 17 also requires, which we believe will be even more fundamental in terms of changing the pricing basis, is if you knowingly enter a contract that you know is going to make a loss, so you know that actually you know, you're at just chasing the top line, you want the premium at any cost. Yeah. 
Um, and we know that that happens in our market quite a lot. So if you want the premium at any cost and you know you're going to make a loss, IFR 17 requires you to book that loss immediately. So you can't wait for the policy to expire, hope that you know, luck prevails and then you don't have to book a loss. Um, equally, um, you know, the, the, the concept of that long-term locked-in profit requires a good profitability framework uh, and a good assessment and understanding of what the underlying profit of a contract is. So irrespective, whether you're a short-term writer or a long-term writer, all insurance companies will need to have in place a way of assessing the profitability of a contract. If it's loss-making, you book the loss. If it's profitable, you earn the loss as you you know, the contract expires. Um, yeah. It, it sounds to me like, uh, and uh, wh why this is of interest is that uh, in my assessment of the insurance industry in this market, it looks like we are a premium rush market. We are now being compelled to be a more profitability centric market. How do you assess that transition and do you think we are ready for it? Um, we will have to get ready for it. Um, are we ready as, as an industry right now? Perhaps not. And there's a lot of external factors and dynamics that come into play. Um, you know, for the insurance penetration that we have, you know, we have so many providers. Um, and I often describe it as, as the piece of, of, of cake is the same size still. Um, um, and we're all fighting for it. Like you said, you know, we're, we're very premium driven. Um, when we speak to boards of directors of insurance companies and they understand the concept around IFR 70, they actually get very excited because this is likely to bring sustainable growth as opposed to the rush for top line. Um, it may mean that we see more consolidation in the market, um, um, but we also need the support of the regulator to help the industry sort of push in that, that profit-centric, sustainable growth direction. Okay. You did mention in your earlier remarks that it is a painful to implement uh, transition. Um, from a local standpoint, how do you assess the landscape as far as implementation is concerned? Jan, th Jan Fast was the um, effective date. Mm -hmm. Do you see high compliance, moderate, none at all? So um, I would say across the industry, everybody has done something. I would say um, probably the top, uh, you know, sort of top quartile, not in terms of size or anything, but you know, there's, there's the top quartile insurance companies that have progressed and actually have transition numbers will be some of the listed companies and then some of the international players that, that have um, you know, entities here. Um, in terms of preparedness, we still have a long way to go as we bring the entirety of the insurance industry um, 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 you know, at par with, with meeting the IFR 17 requirements. The biggest challenge that we face as an industry is one of capacity and capability. Um, resources are technical resources that are able to do this with a pragmatic approach. You know, like I said earlier on, this standard wasn't written for East Africa, wasn't written for Kenya. It was really written for the large companies. So we do need to have a pragmatic approach to meeting the requirements because, you know, we apply IFRS here. We don't have a choice but to, to implement IFRS 17. Um, so the race for resources is real. The market is extremely buoyant. You see people moving around a lot at the moment. Um, uh, but then the other thing is that, 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 that companies must create the internal capacity, discipline and create budgets for this. Otherwise, we will not be able to implement this successfully. Um, where I see us at the end of the year, we will get there. I mean, we are Kenyans. We will get there. Um, you know, if I compare this to IFRS 9, which came about, you know, four years ago, IFRS 17 is probably 10 times harder, even harder than that. Um, and we will probably have a patchwork solution uh, uh, that means that you know, people will have IFRS 17 financial statements, but we will carry on implementing for a couple of years after that, you know, what we call the post-implementation work, to actually truly bet the standard, to truly appreciate it, the systems go live, etc. Kenya has a very fragmented insurance market with many, um, if I could call them, mid-tier to small-tier retail uh, players. And the question that I've heard around IFRS 17 is that, is there some form of hand-holding we can get around how to navigate this transition? Um, it would be really good if, if, if there was industry bodies um, and, and the regulators supporting and hand-holding that. 
Um, but short of that, there is over-reliance on consultants at the moment. Consultants both that operate locally, but also, you know, um, um, we have consultants, tool providers, vendor providers, uh, vendor solution providers um, from other markets, from South Africa, from Europe, that are all sort of operating and targeting this market. Um, but there is a limited that is coming from an industry perspective. Okay. There has been concern raised with me that um, this transition will render um, the balance sheets of insurance firms extremely vulnerable to volatility in market conditions. If you could comment on that and what that means uh, for the firms. Yeah, absolutely. And again, long-term writers more so than the shorter-term writers. Um, if you think about the, the, the emergence of profit over a long period, um, and, and, and the crux of it, and you, to use some technical terminology here, um, the way in which that profit is, 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 is truly measured is you expect a certain level of profit, and then there's the actual profit. The further that departure, the greater the variability in your balance sheet. Now, you know, in as much as we employ people that, that, that you know, can project, including myself who is an actuary, that you know, we, we, we try and project the, the, the future financial outcomes, you're never going to get it right. Um, uh, but there will be a lot of discipline required to try and project those cash flows as accurately as possible to minimize that variability. Short-term writers, the general insurance companies, will see slightly less variability because our products are shorter. Uh, but trying to project 30 years versus projecting two to three years is a big difference. And yes, and that's a concern even globally, the significant variability uh, in, 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 in not just the balance sheets, but actually even just the income statements as well. Okay. Um, you probably me to my next question. If I'm an analyst looking at especially listed insurance firms, what sort of differences do I anticipate in the income statements when I look at IFRS 4 versus IFRS 17? Um, very big differences. So, so um, the income statement looks totally different to what we currently have. And probably two or three of the, the key things. We're so used to gross written premiums. Uh, and, and, and you know that has always been the yardstick with which insurance companies are measured. There is now a new concept in IFRS 17 called insurance revenue. Insurance revenue only exists to the extent you write profitable contracts. Um, and it's, it's, it's actually an actuarially determined number as opposed to just a top line, you know, I wrote premiums of 100, so I book 100. So that's one big difference. But again, that brings some of the things we spoke about, the much needed discipline around sort of profitable, sustainable growth. Um, so that's one big difference. The other one is profitability itself. Um, again, long-term insurers will see a day one impact of, of, of you know, Profits being lower than what they reported in IFRS 4, but obviously they stabilize year on year um, uh, because, be, be, because, of, because you continue then reporting on IFRS 17. That in of itself obviously has an impact on the equity uh, and how that is represented. Um, and, and, you know, I guess what is really critical, not just as an analyst, but as a user of the financial statement, is to understand what is driving those numbers. Um, under IFR 17, you'll see enhanced disclosures. So whilst the income statement is condensed, each item in there now has more substantial disclosures. So what is the makeup of the insurance revenue? What is the makeup of the claims? Uh, you know, within claims, you have to have an explicit risk adjustment. What does that risk adjustment represent? Where is the profit coming from? How is that amortized over the life of the policy? Um, so being able to, 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 to understand that and being able to then compare with probably a greater degree of confidence across insurance companies will help analysts uh, and other, other, other users of financial statements. Um, and, then, and, then, and then I guess also recognizing that within the new disclosures, there also needs to be quite a lot of narrative around the confidence uh, 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 of uh, the confidence interval or, or, or you know, what you call the strength of that reserving basis or that risk adjustment, um, which, which I know analysts will be very, very keen to look at. Okay. So in light, with, in light of that, um, in 2023, then do we anticipate two sets of numbers, IFRS 4 and IFRS 17, or how does this period now look like in terms of reporting? So um, that is a fantastic question, and, and, and not just 2023. I think internally, 
for, for the critical users of financial statement, we will probably see parallel reporting for some years to come. Um, as people close their 2022 years, and we know we're going, we're going into, 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 into disclosure season, uh, March is firmly uh, uh, that month, we will see people close their 2022 year on IFRS 4 with some disclosures around what they expect to come out of IFRS 17. As we get to half your reporting listed, companies will produce IFRS 17 numbers. And of course, as we close 2023, so the first full year under IFRS 17 will be under, 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 under the new reporting basis. From an external reporting requirement, companies will produce numbers under IFRS 17. Uh, but we do expect that the notes, the, the analyst communications, the shareholder communications will provide those comparatives until people get used to and familiar with what those numbers mean. Interesting. What does this mean? What does the transition to IFRS 17 mean for Kenya's insurance penetration? And this is the basis of that question. One, it has been raised that um, we're coming off the back of COVID and COVID really wrecked industries, including insurance. Insurance penetration is generally low in this country. Now you're talking about a reporting standard which is quite challenging for many as far as implementation is concerned. From uh, that broad aspect of insurance penetration in Kenya, what do you expect? Um, so maybe, maybe I would even answer it as, you know, an accounting standard is there for reporting purposes. It's not necessarily um, you know, something that, that drives product development, strategy, um, but it is an informant. Um, and, and what we are seeing in the projects that we're working on and, you know, the clients that we're working with, because of the granularity of, of calculation and analysis that needs to be done to prepare your numbers for IFRS 17, maybe not straight away because, you know, firms are really, really just uh, uh, pushing to, to, to get ready for the standard. Um, in a year or two's time, people will have time to actually analyze those numbers in greater detail, which provide great insights. I mean, the conversation that we just had about profitability. Uh, if you know a product is not profitable, surely you should stop writing that. If you know a product uh, you know, is, is giving you good long-term profit, is sustainable and has good market take-up, surely you should invest more in that. Um, Will that change penetration? Don't know. Will that make the insurance companies better informed about their products? Certainly. I think the conversation about penetration also requires other external factors. Um, you know, it needs to be a government agenda. It needs to be a priority uh, 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 from, a, from a sort of, you know, educating people about the benefits of insurance. Um, and insurance is not just about protecting. There's also the wealth creation aspect. Um, and those are the things that I think really help with penetration. Um, uh, but the understanding of the products will probably help then you know, you know, formulate, formulate, formulate that, that, that penetration strategy further. Given the growing focus under IFRS 17 on profitability, um, someone is likely to ask, um, how does this change the risk posture of insurance firms in the market? Because... Um, Definitely, we have our profitability to think about, but that has an impact in terms of how much risk we can take on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think critical to that is understanding what it is you're taking to market. What is the risk you can insure and what is the price you can get paid for it? Uh, we made comments earlier about, you know, we're chasing premium as opposed to insuring risks. Uh, and insuring risks really comes with, you know, concepts that are familiar in, in the financial services sector, risk-based pricing. Um, so, so, you know, especially directors and, and, and shareholders that understand this standard are quite excited about the prospect of we will then, over sort of a probably a medium term, move fundamentally from top-line driven to risk-based uh, pricing, which is sustainable, generates profits. Uh, but you also have to remember, you know, insurance companies have different risk appetites uh, and, and different biting points because, because of their, their, their own cost base, how, um, you know, how, how, how um, they manage their expenses and, and, and things like that. So there'll always be a range of prices available in the market. 
um, and you want that it's a free market and then the other thing we also have to remember is you know there is always an element of um, if you want a particular client uh, and they're giving you an entirety of, 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 of their insurance policies, you know, so fire, industrial, motor, etc. There'll be some you make money on, some you don't. And as an insurance company, uh, you know, every insurance company will decide whether or not that is an acceptable risk to them, so long as the entirety of the portfolio makes business sense. So, you know, we're not saying that everything will move to you must write profitable otherwise we can't write that business but i think there's a little bit of of, of a give and take there based on appetite and and and, and appreciation of a client base uh, but we will definitely see a transition you can't be you know you can't be reporting losses on day one then that's that's not a sustainable insurance company okay i get into the tail end of our conversation so let's talk a, a little bit about the industry you spoke about the issue of consolidation and uh, we have been having a long-running conversation in this country that uh, do we have too many players in the insurance industry? I'd be very curious to get your thoughts about that. So on the face of it, yes, we do have too many players. You know, if you think about the sort of insurance penetration we've played with over the, over the last decade, you know, anywhere between 3 and 5%, depending on, on the market and how the overall GDP has done. Um, and, and, you know, we have 40-plus players in the market. Um, if you take the same examples and use, um, you know, developed, developed economies, and we don't have to go to the very developed economies, but if you go to Asia, if you go down south, um, uh, excluding the sort of Europe and West, we have much higher insurance penetration for fewer insurance companies. Um, and, and, you know, that's not to say we need to force consolidation. I mean, that's an approach the regulator may choose to use, um, but, but, but we certainly need a slicker insurance uh, industry. Um, at the moment, what this means is, you know, we have uh, a limited pool that we can insure and the number of players keep, you know, keep remaining the same or increasing. And so we're all fighting for that, which then takes away from the crux of insurance. You know, can we truly be a risk-based, uh, 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 you know, insurance industry? Uh, as opposed to the sort of the top line driven. And I think IFRS 17 and the motions that we work through on that, even post implementation, because you know, we might cobble together our balance sheets and our PLs uh, for, for this year end, uh, will bring some of that discipline. Okay. Uh, for a long time, there has been the talk about micro insurance as being the silver bullet which then addresses this issue of insurance penetration in Kenya. It doesn't seem to have worked. Um, what's the missing sweet spot in this? You know, that's, that's a million dollar question. I wish I knew what the missing sweet spot in it is. But, you know, we do keenly observe and follow this. Um, and whilst our economy is ripe for microinsurance, um, I think there are certain factors that, that, that um, you know, inhibit um, perhaps the growth or the scale of growth that, that we would like to see. Some of it is how do you tap into that informal sector? You know, what is the sort of credit risk assessment that you do around that informal sector, the validity of claims, um, you know, all of that needs to be assessed for it to work well. The other element also is um, education around the importance of insurance. Um, you know, if you're an agro uh, 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 farmer, um, the value of that insurance could be um, so powerful to you, but if you don't understand it, you won't buy it. Um, and, and we also, I mean, you know, we also have to acknowledge that the economy that we live in, um, insurance is not something that people wake up and say, yay, I'm excited to buy insurance. Uh, we're still at the stage of I need to earn some money and perhaps generate and create some wealth, savings before you jump on insurance. But I think there's a whole chain of education is key. Um, and, and I don't think we have truly unpacked how we tap into that, that, that um, informal sector, because that's where microinsurance really comes to the fore. All right. That my final question. Um, having listened to you, should we expect subdued profitability from insurance firms, given the transition and what it means in terms of how numbers are booked in by insurance companies? Um, perhaps, I think it's a mixed bag um, from, from those that have already produced their numbers. There's a bit of a mixed bag um, and, and, and for two reasons. So um, where, where there are lots of loss making contracts that exist within a portfolio, you will likely see some subdued profit. 
um, for a lot of long-term writers, um, you know, to the extent that they're reserving, um, or rather the, the, you know, the provisions that they hold for those liabilities have been stable, but also on a slightly prudent or conservative side, uh, you will see that, that whilst there is that day one impact, they will still be able to, to, to manage their profitability within what they expected within their, 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 their pricing frameworks. Um, so it really does depend on what the individual firm's sort of reserving policy, uh, provisioning policy was, uh, which will then impact the sort of, you know, how the profitability plays out. Um, uh, so, so yeah, we, we expect to see a mixed bag really here in, 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 in terms of profitability. Gaurishal, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. And that has been Gaurisha giving us insights into matters regarding IFRS 17 and insurance contracts. Remember, this is something which is significantly changing the landscape. We shall continue covering it to bring you the latest insights on what it means for you. Stay tuned. Thank you.